Okay, so give some background. Uh, go into more detail of what we, we were talking about. So, 13 colonies, colonies of Great Britain. They are established under various and different legal authorities from the King of England. Um, it's a total, there's about two and a half or three million people, um, relatively prosperous. Um, there's a lot of heterogeneity. Um, they're huddled on the eastern seaboard and water travel is a, is a way they, um, they're relatively prosperous by 1750 to 1770 standards, but they're, rel they're poor by our standards today. Um, so until 1765, Britain collected not very much revenue. Um, they collected some from a tax on sugar. They, Britain was, uh, North American colonies were part of the mercantilist system that Britain uh, imposed on its colonies and on its own citizens um, that, that restricted who could trade with whom. Um, and Americans were both restricted by that and they benefited from it. Um, and there was restrictions in particular on American shipping. Um, those are called the Navigation Acts, if you want to Wikipedia them. Um, during the 18th century, as we mentioned, Britain fought a number of costly wars, and they were destined to fight another one in our War of Independence. Um, this one is very significant. The, um, the French and what's called the Seven Year Wars and the French and Indian War, that had a big effect on the United States because um, we acquired um, Britain and the colonies acquired new West territories in the West, in Ohio and the North, what was called the Northwest. Um, so big parts of um, the Midwest were conquered from the French in that war. So that cost a lot. It ultimately benefited the United States a lot. The question is who's gonna pay? So the, the public debt to GDP ratio in Britain uh, grew a lot. Um, and th th here's, a, here's, a, here's a graph. Um, um, we see the, um, this is where it goes, goes from around 100 to uh, within a short period of time to over, um, to over, uh, to over 150% of GDP, the substantial increase. So Britain was interested in, in having some of the beneficiaries of this war, um, Help, help pay for this um, big increase in government debt. Um, so, um, so there's there's going to be an enduring question: what's the um, what's the relationship between central and subordinate governments? Um, what's the relationship between you know the way to think of it is in before the American Revolution, the American colonies were like um, counties or um, uh, our uh, municipalities within within a state. Um, so this increase in the the, the need to finance uh, the service of British government debt um, shook up the existing um, arrangements. So starting in 1763, Britain. Uh, chose to uh, maintain a standing army in the United States, partly to protect the colonists from um, the Native Americans who weren't who weren't particularly happy to have the British take over um, the the lands that they had taken over from the French. So Britain decided that it would be fair for the Americans to pay a, for a third of those costs. Um, and then this question lies, well, so there's that standing army. Is, is that there to protect the colonies or is that there to, um, to repress them? Um, 
In addition, Britain did the following thing. Um, actually, this is politically incorrect. This is uh, European um, Americans, Euro European ascendants. Um, so, so we were Britain had conquered a bunch of uh, land in the West that was mainly occupied by uh, it had been occupied by French, a f very sparsely centered by French and their Indian allies, their Native American allies, um, and uh, they weren't. Um, they had, th those allies had been allies of the French during the war. They would fought against the British. And Britain was interested in maintaining peace and didn't want a lot of new um, European, uh, North American European settlers going into uh, those lands. So they restricted that immigration, but the American colonists wanted to move there. Like, um, so that created a conflict. Um, so that's, those lands are going to reoccur. So the British government, as I mentioned before the great break, engaged in a series of ultimately uh, frustrated and aborted attempts to raise revenues. Um, they did various things. In 1764, they did something that we'll come back to. The American colonies had issued, almost all of them, they issued paper money. Remember the little model of token and commodity monies. Um, some of the first big experiments with token monies came from the American colonies. Um, we'll talk about that later in a lecture because Adam Smith's going to comment on it. Um, and in some of the, some of the colonies, uh, too much, so much was issued that we went from our regime one to regime two. And there was, there was, depreciate substantial depreciation of the tokens and Britain uh, was annoyed with that and they passed an act that prohibited colonies from issuing paper money the colonists did not like that um, so again there were efforts to make the Americans pay taxes the Americans didn't like it um, there's some details in these slides which I'll provide to you um, but essentially, a, a festering tax revolt is going on um, in the American colonies um, who don't want to pay for the protection um, that they're being offered or required to take. So um, there's these things called the Townsend Acts, which are increases uh, in taxes. Um, and again, what's the rationale? Um, to pay for some things that are that are um, that are being done in America, uh, the British think they're doing them for the Americans, partly, and the Americans are are seeing this partly as a an effort to trans transfer the uh, fiscal authority from the colonial assemblies, which had been pretty autonomous to to London. Um, there's this famous thing called the uh, Boston Tea Party. Um, it's part of this tax revolt, um, and um, it's an act of vandalism by American patriots uh, to express their displeasure at this tea tax. Um, so the British respond with some um, violence of their own, and um, the situation escalates, and, um, and there's this first Continental Congress that met. And at the beginning, the goal of this Congress is not directly to have a revolution, but to represent in a coherent and unified way that the Americans wanted certain policies changed and they wanted certain institutions changed. And at that stage, most, most people wanted, most Americans wanted to stay part of Britain, but there was this incident, um, it's like with big unintended consequences, there was a what developed into a battle in Lexington and Concord. It didn't start that way. Lexington and Concord are two cities in, um, near Boston, where George lives. Um, so this uh, incident uh, escalated into an armed conflict, 
and um, and the, that started the revolution. The Americans then wanted to be independent, but they had well, they wanted to be they were going to be try to be independent against the strongest army and the strongest navy in the world, and um, so they have an imme immediate um, problem. And here's a big problem. This revolution is born in a tax revolt. They didn't want to pay the Britain, the British. But if they're going to become independent, they're going to have to fight the British and they're going to have to pay for it somehow. So they're going to have to, the British aren't going to pay for, for it. They're going to find, have to find some way to pay for the revolution. So the question is how to finance the revolution. So, Here's a very stripped down version of our government budget constraint that we've talked about before. And I'm gonna assume this is much simpler than what we talked about the first hour. We're gonna assume that um, what you have is one period debt. Uh, that's the return on the debt. That's the debt you came in with last period. That's the return you're gonna to have to pay. Um, the debt you're gonna go out with is gonna to have to be the sum of the debt you came in with, plus the return you pay, plus the excess of government expenditures over taxes, um, minus any revenues you raise with money creation. So you can raise revenues with money creation, and one of the exercises is all about that. So this is really, this is, this is the inflation tax. It's also called, you'll also see it referred to um, there's a history of this term, seniorage, government seniorage. It's the government revenues from printing money. So the government's options to finance government expenditures, which it has to do, it can tax now. I can move this to the other side. It can borrow or can print money. And what we're going to see is what fraction of these various choices they Continental Congress took. So now the person, the question, big problem is, who are you gonna tax? Um, and the question is, and if you're gonna borrow, who, who are you gonna borrow from? Um, because prospective lenders, they wanna know who's gonna borrow the Continental Congress and the individual states, the new 13 states are gonna borrow. Um, but if they're gonna, here's our equation. The value of government debt today is the discounted present value of government surpluses. So government creditors are looking, um, you know, if they're gonna be paid, if they're, if they're not just giving charity, but they're actually lending in return for a stream of payouts, this, the backing of those payoffs are government surpluses. So, um, this is the equation that says you can, if you borrow today, it's a signal you're gonna tax more than you're gonna spend tomorrow. So the question is who's gonna accept Continental Congress's IOUs as payments for goods and services? This, this is the central question. So Congress tried all of these things. Um, and we'll show you some numbers on what they tried. And what they're doing is they're improvising. Um, you know, the revolution is 1776, and that's the date that Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations was published. And among the members of the Continental Congress were intellectuals um, who read things like that and thought about them. Um, so, so how could you how could you tax? Um, well, actually, there's. Um, we all talked about the French Revolution. There's something left out of here. We can, uh, of this list, you can uh, expropriate and sell. Okay, so um, one is you can, what the central government can do is it can ask for contributions from the states. What it can do, also, it can, uh, and some of the things that the states will, how are the states going to, get the revenues, they're gonna to have to tax their citizens. And what a number of states did is they, they nationalized lands from 
people owned by people who were, they had titles of the property, but they were loyal to Britain. They were called Tories. So one state after another, that's a Tory, that's someone, that's someone who is a citizen of one of the states, but is loyal to Britain. And those people were regarded not as patriots by the people who were pulling off the revolution. And there were lots of them. The state governments grabbed their lands and then sold them off to, to raise revenues. That's one big source. Um, there are some patriots who are, who are making gifts to the central government, to the Continental Congress. Um, there's ways of selling public goods. There's privateering. If you go to the United States Constitution, it says that only the Congress can issue letters of mark. Go look up letters of mark. What that is is you have a, sh you have a boat. Um, you're just a private citizen. And what I do is I, I license you on the authority of the, uh, of the, of the government of the United States to uh, go buy some guns and become a, effectively a pirate. And what you do is you uh, capture you capture British merchant ships, and the deal is you get to keep half of the goods. You're going to capture that ship. Um, it's uh, you're going to sell the ship and the goods on the ship. Um, you're going to be a pirate, and uh, if you have this letter of mark, you're a pirate who's uh, working for the U.S. government, and uh, we're going to split the profits with you fifty fifty. So the United States did that in its early wars. Um, it's in the Constitution. The other thing it did is it leveled the inflation tax we've already talked about. It issued these things called continental dollars, and they have a name called bills of credit. Um, we'll come back to that. Um, so continental dollars and bills of credit are going to become words of um, disrepute. And then the government borrowed. So it taxed. It levied this inflation tax, and it borrowed. It borrowed domestically from its uh, various citizens, and, and we'll spend some time talking about that. Um, George is doing a lot of research on this, which is fascinating. We also borrowed from some foreigners, and we got gifts from some foreigners um, from France. And um, I showed you the French budget. Uh, France is lending to the United States um, and uh, because it wants to... The fiscal crisis that I told you about in France is um, is dependent, is interrelated to their helping the United States. Okay, so um, I've told you about lotteries, Continental Congress requisitions. Um, what's missing from that list? Uh, robbing Tories, grabbing their land and selling it. So. The French government knew that we did that. Remember I told you, this is all going on in 1776 to 1780 when we're doing this. The French Revolution starts in 1789, and they knew that the Americans had raided revenues by, um, by expropriating and selling off lands. So I told you what they did with the church uh, lands. So, um, um, okay. So now I'm gonna tell you what bills of credit are. This is gonna be, remember our little model? We had S bar minus S as some money, um, plus um, we, had, we had this equation, E S bar minus S plus M over P is equal to K times C from a few weeks ago. Um, bills of credit, that's gonna be our M. And um, so what's kind of the monetary regime? So if you went back in the time of the revolution, um, there's lots of, there's lots of uh, coins circulating in the United States. There's silver coins and gold coins, and they're from different countries. Lots of them are from Spain or Mexico because there, was, uh, there were silver mines in, in Peru and uh, Mexico, and there were mints in Mexico and Spanish... Uh, Silver was minted into coins that uh, maintained their silver value for for centuries, and um, basically the dollar 
was widely used. The Spanish dollar was widely used as a unit of account in the currency. And it will be the unit of account that's used throughout the revolution. And those things are circulating. So what the, so for us, S bar minus S, uh, that's silver uh, dollars circulating, and E is that exchange rate. Um, so the Continental Congress in 1775, they authorized things called bills of credit. They're called continental dollars. Um, so I mentioned that American, this wasn't a new thing, that the, the individual colonies had actually issued bills of credit, that paper money, and that 1864 law, uh, 1764 law, uh, prohibiting those. The British government said A1764 had limited, restricted the uh, colonists' ability to issue bills of credit because they had generated some depreciation. Uh, one thing that happened with the Declaration of Independence is we didn't have to obey that anymore. So all the American colonies, the American states started issuing bills of credit of their own, and so did the central government. Um, actually, some of these. Okay, so remember I had regime one and regime two in that small open economy? Uh, some of these, the successful ones, they stayed in regime, um, they stayed in regime one. So those are the ones that the slide, they, they sustained good reputations. They weren't all failures. Um, some worked quite well. So in 1775, get back to the theme, a dollar meant a Spanish mill dollar. That's what it meant. Um, ultimately, one th a little earlier, Spain and Austria were united under one kingdom, and the word dollar comes from thaler, an Austrian word. Okay, so that's a Spanish mill dollar. There they are. Okay, so guess what? That's this one. That's a Spanish dollar. It's silver dollar. It's got a certain amount of silver. That's, guess what this is? That's a half dollar. So how do you create a half dollar from a, a dollar? You cut it in half. Carry it in your pocket. Okay, how do you create a, a quarter dollar? You cut the half dollar in half. So now you have a quarter dollar. And now there's this famous phrase, pieces of eight. How do you create a piece of eight? You cut the quarter in half and you get eight. These things are called pieces of eight. Google those. Um, still buy these, coin collectors like these. Lots of these are, um, yeah, there were lots of these. They were used all over the world, all over the New World and Europe. That's a Spanish mill dollar. So here's what a continental dollar is. Um, there were lots of these printed. So look what it says on it. It's kind of interesting. Um, it says this bill, this is called a bill of credit. It's $3, entitles the bearer to receive three Spanish meal dollars. So this is a Continental Congress is promising to pay three Spanish meal dollars in, or the value thereof in gold or silver, according to these resolutions of May 1775, okay? And then it's got, it's got some nice words in it. Now it has this, it has this, uh, this image on it. You know, if you look at, if you're, if you look today at the dollar, the US dollar, um, first thing it doesn't say, it's very different. It's got, it's got some pictures on it. It's got a picture of George Washington and the other side it has some symbols. It doesn't say, the U.S. dollar does not say, this bill entitles the bearer to receive one Spanish mill dollar or the value of gold and silver uh, equivalent. It doesn't say that. It says, in God we trust. No promise to convert it into anything. It's inconvertible. This was supposedly convertible. Instead of George Washington, we have this thing on it. So, uh, I don't know if you read Latin or... But look at this, these two birds 
fighting. There's a, actually a heron underneath and there's a falcon above. And um, actually, Benjamin Franklin suggested that they put this on. And this Latin phrase says, Exodus in dubio est. That's the phrase. Instead of, that's what it says. So what does that say? Um, okay. So exodo, Exodus in dubio est means, it tells you something about the attitude of it. It says the outcome is in doubt. So that tells you something about their attitude at the beginning of this war. It's from Ovid. Um, Benjamin Franklin suggested this book. Um, if you go back to that book, um, and I don't know if, if you can imagine Donald Trump uh, saying, you know, what should we put on our coins? Well, let's go back and get this uh, book uh, in Latin about symbols and emblems. And uh, so that we'll get this story. So that's where this, that's where this came from. It's a reference to this story. And, and what does it mean? So Bob Lucas asked me, what does this mean? And then George, George, he asked me, what does this mean? And why put this on there? Uh, what does the Latin phrase mean? And what's the symbolic meaning of these birds? And so um, it's uh, explains the battles of Mars and wars are dubious and uncertain. He often loses who is near victory. And although, so the spirit is, although the odds heavily favor the falcon, the one on top, the heron's excrements could render the falcon unable to fly by soiling its plumage. So in 1775, the American colonies think they're underneath and they are not going to fight fair. Um, that's what this, that's what that says. Um, okay. So, so now, um, Talk about America, and we're gonna, this little model, see, um, this little model that we talked about, this model, uh, I wrote down that model uh, because I wanted to uh, help myself understand these observations we're talking about right now and understand some of the things Adam Smith and others said. Okay, so, um, so in the United States, there was, it's widely said there was a shortage of media of exchange. They said there was actually a shortage of, uh, of silver coins, of Spanish coins, especially when um, before that 1764 regulation was put in place by the Britons. So, um, so now let's just think through, we're gonna follow in the footsteps of Adam Smith, people saying there's shortages, uh, but there's, um, the shortages, so therefore people are using these, these tokens, these paper money. So what Adam Smith said, uh, maybe you should reverse the there. So it's true that there weren't banks in America. Um, there weren't lots of bonds or liquid assets. There were, all the assets were illiquid. There were lots, not lots of markets. There weren't gold or silver mines in North America like there were in South America. But the following, an American colony could easily get all the gold and silver coins that it wanted. How could it acquire them? Um, it could run international current account surpluses and import them just like anything else. Um, so the fact that there were, if there were shortages of coins, it's because Americans chose not to run those surplus, current account surpluses, and they didn't want big stocks of hard money, specie, in North America. And they were, they were early recognizers of the insight of David Ricardo. So let's go to Adam Smith, um, what he says. He says, um, the present scarcity of gold and silver money in America. Now he's writing this, when he wrote this, it takes a while, he published the book in 1776. So this book is, uh, this is written before he knew there was a revolution, at least this part. He says, the present scarcity of gold and silver is not the effect of the poverty of the country or of the inability of the people there to purchase those metals. Um, so he says the wages of labor are much higher in, Brit in, in, the, United in, in the colonies. Uh, it's because labor was really scarce. Um, and the price of provisions are so much lower than in England. The greater the power of the people must surely have the resources to purchase a greater quantity of money if they wanted. 
The scarcity of those metals must therefore be an effect of choice and not of necessity. Just one of many, many examples showing you what a clear economic analyst Smith is. And he says this, the domestic business of every country may at least in peaceful times be transaction by means of a paper currency with nearly the same degree of conveniency as by gold and silver. It is convenient for the Americans who could always employ with profit in the improvement of their lands a greater stock than they can easily get to save as much as possible the expense of so constantly an instrument of commerce as gold and silver. The colony governments find it in their interest to supply the people with such a quantity of paper money as is sufficient and generally more than sufficient that's the mistake for transacting their, their, um, their domestic business. Remember, if you, if you give more than sufficient, you're going to have some inflation. So that's currency. That's kind of the background. And he's commenting on things Americans already knew. Okay. Um, so going back, colonial governments issued bills of credit partly to provide money. And for the most part, it worked. Um, so this slide, um, I guess the only thing we're going to get new from this is, um, remember, this is our little model. Um, that we had a couple lectures ago. Um, this stuff is called specie. It's money in gold or silver. It's also called hard money. We'll, we'll see that later. Um, well, I mean, that's hard to figure out. It's, uh, it's hard money because um, gold and silver are relatively hard relative to paper. Um, so why did anyone um, accept bills of credit? Um, well, see our model. That's why we did this. That's the experiment. And regime one, uh, it's easy to understand. Regime two, um, that's what we fell into. Um, okay, so um, so here's what happens. Uh, Congress um, issues these bills of credit, and um, we'll show you a picture of it. Um, so states um, states were asked to accept these bills of credit in payment of states taxes and they they were asked to return um, those bills of credit to the Continental Congress after they had collected them as taxes and Continental Congress promised to burn those bills of credit promised to burn them remember I told you this um, story about France um, they, where they did exactly the same thing and for a while they kept the promise um, now, Congress has harsh words um, eventually for people who, um, who won't accept those bills of credit. Now, you'll notice in our little model, you don't need harsh words. The equilibrium of that little model was those, that M was as good as, it was as good as silver or gold if it wasn't, if too much wasn't issued. But the Continental Congress, it's not people's lost to all virtue in regard to his country, that's not what did it. It's that the Congress issued too much. Um, okay, so Congress, uh, there's kind of a number. There's about 25 to 30 million uh, Spanish dollars is the total money supply. Uh, if, like if I took this number, E times S bar minus S at the beginning of the revolution, um, that number is about 25 million or 30 million. And, um, you know, so you could ask just the back of the envelope Congress uh, calculation, kind of using our model, how much could, how much could the Continental Congress issue um, in, this, in these tokens and not cause any, any inflation? And you'd say, well, around 25 to 30 million. 
So instead, they issued this amount, uh, about 200 billion. Actually, more like 250. <laughs> but they actually redeemed some. So, show you a picture. Um, it's an interesting picture. This kind of, it's a picture that, um, that George constructed in several ways. The blue line is the, the total amount of uh, continental dollars that were, that were, um, that were emitted. And you see, you see it's heading north. Now we've drawn a, we've drawn a, a line right here at 25 million. That's 25 and eventually gets to, and so until um, early 1777, um, they haven't issued, their M is, is still small relative to stock of specie. So our little model tells us, well, you can get away with issuing some of that and you don't necessarily have a depreciation. Now, I should say, throughout the war, the unit of account remained Spanish silver. It wasn't the continental dollar. If you look at prices quoted in Philadelphia or other cities, they were quoted in Spanish silver um, dollars. Okay. Um, in the, um, we'll see another war where that was not true. Okay, so, um, well, this is just the quantity theory of money. We already, we already saw that this is our regime too uh, that we're worried about. Um, so, so this slide kind of tells you what happened, um, but this graph is going to show you. Um, so we're going to show you some exchange rates, uh, various records. We tell you where it got. Um, we're going to use some exchange rates in Philadelphia, and we're going to share this graph. So here's my blue line again. Um, it's actually extended farther out. The blue line is the total amount of uh, continental dollars um, issued, and then actually some were retired in, in this period. Some were retired. And they're measured, they're, so they were retired because some taxes were paid in them, and they were retired. And what this line right here is, there's our 25 or 30 million line right here. And here again, we see until 1775, the um, not, not that much, had, you know, less had been issued than the, than the amount of silver in circulation, roughly speaking, until um, before the war. But now, after, starting in 1777, they start issuing more and more. They exceed that. And it's at that point, look what happens to the exchange rate. Um, the exchange rate is the number of uh, dollars. In the, the exchange rate scales over here. Um, the number of dollars, and actually this is probably um, too charitable to the continental dollar. The exchange rate starts, um, starts, instead of being, here it's close to one to one. Very close to one to one. A little bit of depreciation. And then once you... Uh, go into this, we're in regime two, and now what's going to happen is um, this green line is going to depart from one to one, it's going to keep going, and here it gets to not worth a continental, and um, it actually went, it went over a hundred uh, by some estimates, and that number a hundred, we'll see, and um, what this means is um, kind of tenuous, um, it's probably not a market price, but these probably are market prices. So what, what we see, this is, um, this is a little proposition in our model. Um, this little calculation here shows that uh, that little tiny model, which is a little algebra, is kind of taking us to um, how, see this is Adam Smith's experiment. You issue a little money, uh, you can save yourself on, on, senior, on, on silver. Um, you kind of, it actually might be better for the reasons he said. But if you issue too much, um, you're gonna go into regime two. Okay, and um, then here's another picture, um, which is that um, this is gonna be 
this is really a kind of a graph of M over P. And this actually looks, this, is, this looks like a graph we showed you for the French Revolution. At the beginning, until around 1770, when the government, this is M, that was our continental dollars, um, governments issue more and more of them, the real value of them actually increases. Um, and then what happens is, as more and more are issued, the real value shrinks. And people want to hold less and less. And the price level rises, the, the price level as measured in, in terms of um, continental dollars, depreciation, real balances fall because people flee that currency. So it's not true. Okay, and this is part of the exercise. This, this links back to the, I'm gonna, I'm nearly out of time, but this is gonna be, a good, instead of MP being K over C, M over P is gonna be some function of the expected rate of inflation or depreciation. And that's what's, that's what's going on here. Um, shows our little theories, um, really at work in, in conditions in which um, the forces that they highlight are really isolated. And um, I guess next time we'll start talking about these loans that were made. And um, these loans, the rap musical Broadway hit Hamilton, um, these loans are the things that uh, Hamilton had very strong opinions about. Um, he had strong opinions about, Hamilton had strong opinions about this, Hamilton and Morris about this, and they had strong opinions about these loans. So, and there, you could think of currency as a loan too. It's a, you know, how do I, why do I say it's a loan? Go back and read what's in that bill of credit, three Spanish dollars, it's a promise made by the Continental Congress. Congress made other loans, large denomination loans, uh, that were paying interest, unlike the Continental Dollar, which didn't pay interest. They made large denomination loans that are paying interest at first four percent, and then six percent. See, the minimum denomination wasn't three dollars; it was two hundred dollars, and um, they're not intended to circulate as currency. So, where we're going to start next time is where I uh, take up what the fate of these loans were, and oh, here's what one looks like. Um, so I'll show you some of those. And um, but you gave me some homework uh, today, and I owe you um, I owe you an answer to a um, really good question that was asked earlier. And um, I will try to uh, figure out what the answer is. How do you want to submit the homework? Just bring in a hard copy or email. Um, whatever's convenient for you. I like, I like getting, um, I like, I like getting an email and you can hand it in anytime before then. Um, you know, if you, if you, um, if you do it in a PDF, 